Amanda Ann DeGuio was born on March 5, 1990, to parents Joanne and John DeGuio. Amanda's family describes her as free-spirited, who was stylish, charismatic, and fun. Amanda graduated from Haverford High School in Havertown, Pennsylvania in 2008, where she was a member of the Lady Ford's competitive cheer squad. Amanda was diagnosed with asthma when she was only 11 months old, and she spent a good amount of time in the hospital during her teen years undergoing breathing treatments. She also had surgery to correct a hiatal hernia at age two, and afterward relied on a feeding tube for three months. Due to all her medical problems, she wanted a career in the healthcare industry and wanted to work at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. During her senior year of high school, Amanda was accepted into the nursing program at Newman University, a local college not far from her high school. During her first year at Newman, she moved into a dorm but found the rules too restrictive for her. So she moved back home and began commuting back and forth. She then found out she was pregnant, so she decided to drop out of the nursing program and enrolled in the medical assistant program at the Chai Institute in the nearby Marple Township. In 2014, 24-year-old Amanda was now the mother of two young daughters but had sadly developed a drug addiction after she was prescribed Percocet a couple of days after giving birth. On top of that, she had bipolar disorder and was diagnosed with a temporary painful flesh-eating disease. Her mother said the disease was so painful that Amanda was put on a morphine drip for at least two weeks. Eventually, the Percocet addiction turned into a heroin addiction. On June 3, 2014, Amanda returned to her mother Joanne's home, where she had been staying on Hiawatha Lane in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, after a family trip to Disney World. At this point, she had already been in rehab twice and was talking about getting help for a third time. However, after coming home that day, she left unexpectedly and has never been seen again. She didn't drive and most likely caught a ride with someone. About a week after Amanda left, a warrant was issued for her arrest after she walked into a pharmacy and picked up someone else's OxyContin prescription. Three months later, on August 27, 2014, her family decided to report her missing. While searching for Amanda, her sister came across an escort advertisement for Amanda's services on the website Backpage.com. This led investigators to believe she was involved in prostitution in order to pay for her drug addiction. In September 2022, investigators received a tip and began searching the backyard of a home in the 200 block of Red Pump Road in Nottingham, Pennsylvania. However, it proved to be a dead end after no signs of Amanda were found. At least two people known to run in her circle have since died from an opioid overdose. It's now been over nine years since Amanda was last seen, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Marquia Benson was born on February 2, 1980. In 2016, 36-year-old Marquia lived in Unit G-15 of the New Orleans Park Apartments in Sicane, Pennsylvania, and was employed at Sig Combley Block in Chester. Those who knew her described her as an ambitious and kind individual. On March 30, 2016, Marquia failed to show up for work, so a male friend of hers and a co-worker went to her apartment to check on her. They arrived around 4 p.m. and found her car still in the parking lot. They went up to the apartment, but the door was locked, as was the sliding glass door. They then went to the office and explained the situation and were eventually let in. Once inside her apartment, they discovered the furniture had been knocked over and papers were thrown all over the floor. Some had even spread feces throughout the apartment and wrote derogatory words on the walls with red lipstick. Sadly, when they entered the bathroom, they found Marquia's body in the bathtub with the shower still running hot water. Investigators determined that Marquia was murdered by blunt force trauma in her bedroom before being placed in the tub around 9.30 a.m. She had also suffered burns from the scalding hot water. Investigators believe Marquia knew her killer, who they described as a person filled with hatred and predatory sadistic violence. One of Marquia's neighbors told investigators that she was arguing with a man several days before her murder. 
Then tips began pouring in, with multiple people mentioning one man's name, an ex of hers. They discovered he called her numerous times after she was murdered and left a voicemail every time asking angrily why she was avoiding him. The two had dated from 2009 to 2013, but he was abusive and she eventually ended things. While the calls might suggest he was unaware of her murder, investigators believe it's the exact opposite and he was making the calls to take the suspicions off of him. Interestingly, the ex told investigators exactly what he did after the murder with the times, locations, and food he ordered. However, between the night of the 29th and the morning of the murder, he was unable to provide any details of his whereabouts. Investigators did find some text messages from him to Marquia on the night before the murder. At 7.28 p.m. on March 29th, he sent Marquia a message saying he couldn't hang out. After that, his phone had zero activity until around the time Marquia was murdered. He then proceeds to leave her four voicemails on the day of the murder, starting at 1.18 p.m. He's even allegedly failed a polygraph, but unfortunately, there's still not enough evidence to arrest him for the murder, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Fawn Marie Mountain was born on March 2, 1987. I read that Fawn got involved in an abusive relationship at a young age, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out how old she was at the time. After having two children with this man, he left, which devastated Fawn. She then began using drugs and alcohol as a way to cope and would continue dating abusive men. This led to her losing custody of her two children. She eventually got pregnant for a third time, but the baby was sadly stillborn. In 2009, 25-year-old Fawn met Heather Dybert at a bar called The Island in Altoona, Pennsylvania. She and Heather began dating and eventually moved into a mobile home on Binks Mill Court in Claysburg. Unfortunately, this relationship was no different than her past relationships, with the abuse continuing. Heather began secluding Fawn from her family and would rarely let her out of her sight. She would even lock Fawn in her car while she worked and set the alarm so she would be alerted if she tried to get out. When she would leave Fawn at home, she would padlock the door from the outside to keep her from leaving. She also had all calls to Fawn's cell phone forwarded to her own. This became too much for Fawn, and she began looking for a way to leave, but with no money, there was little she could do. Plus, in the back of her mind, she felt that Heather was only doing these things out of love. Fawn had made multiple attempts to leave Heather, and in February 2011, during one of the times Heather locked her in the car, she decided to make a break for it. She found a phone and called a friend to come get her. She then decided to go by the trailer to retrieve her daughter's ashes, but the trailer was locked and she didn't have a key. Heather, already assuming Fawn would do this, had called the police and reported that Fawn was breaking in. Fawn was then arrested, charged with felony burglary and trespassing, in order to pay a fine of $2,700. Since Fawn was not allowed to work and had no way to pay the fine, she had to rely on Heather. On November 25, 2012, Heather, Heather's brother, and his girlfriend, along with Fawn, went to Heather's parents' home to help clean and sterilize the butcher shop they owned. After coming back home that day, Fawn was never seen again. The next morning, November 25, 2012, Heather's brother's girlfriend saw Heather smoking a cigarette outside and talking to her parents. She asked Heather where Fawn was, and Heather said that when she woke up to use the bathroom at 3 a.m., Fawn was gone, and she hadn't seen her since. Fawn left behind all of her clothes, as well as an urn containing her child's ashes that she usually took everywhere with her. Over the next several weeks, Heather seemed very calm about Fawn's disappearance, which was unusual since she was very possessive of Fawn and didn't like to go anywhere without her. Heather's family then completely remodeled the trailer, even tearing up the floor, starting a week after Fawn went missing. After that, Heather moved to Ohio. She then returned to Pennsylvania a few months later with a new girlfriend. During this time, her stories about what happened to Fawn constantly changed. 
She would tell some people that Fawn was in prison in Ohio and would tell others that she was working in the sex trade. According to Fawn's mother, Heather once tried to choke Fawn, and Fawn repeatedly went to the hospital to get treatment for injuries sustained in the relationship. She had gone to the emergency room so often that the doctors became suspicious. Once Heather noticed this, she began taking her to different hospitals. Three years later, in April 2015, Fawn's family tried to contact her because her stepfather was dying in the hospital. They sent a family friend to Fawn's last known residence, her trailer on Binks Mill Court, but Heather told the person she took off three years earlier. At this point, Fawn's family decided to report her missing. It's theorized that Heather murdered Fawn and had help from her family to cover up the crime scene. Suspiciously, the trailer has since burned down. Did something happen in the butcher shop the night they were cleaning it, or possibly inside the trailer that night? It's of note that Heather was arrested and charged with assaulting her wife in October 2023. Sadly, Fawn has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Caden Black was born on December 10, 2003, to parents Maurice and Kara. At the age of 19, Caden had been struggling with mental health issues and was living at a friend's house in Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. He had recently been diagnosed with autism in addition to bipolar disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. He was in therapy and taking medication, but allegedly stopped the medication due to the side effects. Caden had an incident in March of 2022 when he was 18. He was seated on the school bus, but decided to switch seats. The bus driver asked him to return to his original seat, but Caden refused. The bus driver then pulled over and demanded Caden get off the bus. When he refused, he and the bus driver got into a physical altercation, and Caden was arrested for the incident. Before this, he had moved with his mother, Kara, to Maryland, but wasn't happy and ended up back in Pennsylvania living with his dad. However, after being bailed out following the arrest, he decided to move in with his lifelong friend's family instead of returning to his father's home. On Saturday, December 17, 2022, while still staying with the Faust family, Caden asked if he could go ride go-karts in Cumberland County, but the father, Chris Faust, said no. When the next morning rolled around, Caden was gone. By Tuesday, December 20th, when there was still no sign of Caden, Chris called Kara to ask if she had seen him. His father, Maurice, had also been trying to get in touch with him, but his calls were going straight to voicemail. When he called the morning Caden was discovered missing, the Faust family told him that Caden was in his room sleeping. It could be they didn't realize he was gone at that point and assumed he was still in his room. Chris even said that Caden was known for sleeping in. Caden worked at Delator's A1 Moving, but never showed up for his Monday shift. When authorities got involved, they discovered his phone last ping near the Faust residence on the morning he went missing. They even went a step further and had his cell phone cloned, and from this, they learned that on Sunday morning, his phone was still connected to the Wi-Fi in the house until 9.30 a.m. Investigators brought in electronic sniffing dogs to search the Faust home for the phone, but it was never found. To this day, it remains missing. Along with his cell phone, his wallet and bank card were also missing, but the rest of his belongings were still in the home. Maurice, desperate to find his son, reached out to a psychic who told him that Caden's body was in a nearby river. The police chief then had a local diver school search the portion of the river the psychic mentioned, but nothing was found. Strangely, he didn't leave in his Toyota 4Runner that Chris had helped him overhaul. After going missing, the Faust family sold the vehicle. Chris said he did offer it to Kara for $7,000, but she denied this. Kara believes her son may have fled due to the upcoming court date for the school bus incident. There's also a part of her that believes foul play was involved in his disappearance. About nine months after he went missing, a false lead was submitted to police that Caden had been seen with his father at the local scrapyard. Two officers went to Maurice's home with a search warrant, thinking he was hiding Caden. However, the search turned up nothing, and video footage from the scrapyard showed that Maurice was there alone. 
Some believe the Faust family is involved, and the police were even asked to search some property they own in a rural area of Pennsylvania. However, the Faust family has denied this and says they are frustrated by the accusations from the public. It's now been almost a year since Caden was last seen, and as of November 2023, this case remains unsolved. Twenty-nine-year-old Jesse Lee Farber lived in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, where he grew up, and was described as a laid-back person with a good sense of humor who enjoyed outdoor activities. On August 1, 2015, Jesse's girlfriend, Rachel Carroll, whom he shares two children with, kicked him out of their apartment after large amounts of money continued to go missing. Jesse then moved into a camper at his grandmother's house a couple of miles outside of town. He worked at Libby's Ice Cream Factory a couple of miles away, but didn't have a mode of transportation, so he either walked or got a ride. On August 10, 2015, Jesse got a ride into Tamaqua with his step-grandfather. He had his camo backpack with him, which he used to carry his work coveralls and boots in. He then met up with a woman named Karina Leach, for an unknown reason, who ended up allegedly stealing money from him. He then went to a friend's apartment on Pine Street, where his friends Dustin Anke and Johnny Manis were. Also inside the apartment was Dustin's girlfriend, Sammy Wagoner, along with her mother, Lori, and Lori's boyfriend, Ryan Ellis. According to them, they sat around playing PlayStation until after midnight. During this time, Jesse was messaging the boyfriend of the woman who stole some of his money. The boyfriend allegedly apologized and offered to repay it. The next day, on August 11th, Jesse left the apartment to go meet up with a drug dealer. However, he arrived too late, and the drug deal never happened. Jesse's communication with the woman's boyfriend, Cal Hops, continued, and they discussed meeting on Broad Street, which eventually changed to Burger King so he could be repaid the money that was stolen. Jesse then contacted work and told them he would be in at 3 p.m. Unfortunately, he would never arrive. A friend of his, Brittany Pester, reported seeing him at Burger King standing inside, but the manager, Harry Lux, allegedly watched the surveillance and never saw Jesse. Rachel said that at 9.09 p.m. that night, Jesse called her in a panic, saying that 10 or 11 coyotes were chasing him on the mountain behind the high school. He told her he was stuck in a tree, his phone was dying, and that she needed to bring some guns. Rachel and her brother went looking for him without guns, believing the coyotes he was referring to weren't actual animals. However, they never found him, and he's never been heard from again. Rachel then notified the authorities, who also searched for Jesse but couldn't find him. A witness came forward and reported seeing Jesse at 7.20 p.m. walking out of town south on Hunter Street towards a trail that leads west into the coal fields. For the next few days, multiple search and rescue teams, along with law enforcement and his family, searched all over for him. They even sent cameras into coal mine air shafts but found nothing, and on August 16th, the official search ended. One of Jesse's friends from the night of August 10th said that he was going to buy some meth. This surprised Rachel because she had never seen him do drugs before. In December 2016, almost a year and a half after he went missing, a hunter found his sweatpants in a tree on a remote, steep mountainside near the top of Sharp Mountain. His backpack was also discovered higher up in the same tree. This spot was miles from where he told Rachel he was and was next to a coal ridge of cliffs, shafts, and hidden tunnels. It's possible in the dark of the night that he accidentally fell into one of the mine shafts, which could be up to 140 feet deep. It's unclear to this day if he was actually hiding from coyotes, since they are not known to hunt in packs. A very plausible theory is that Jesse was having drug-induced hallucinations, or that the coyotes were actually referring to members of a drug gang. Jesse's mother believes strongly in the gang theory and thinks the gang members planted his belongings in the tree after his disappearance to mislead the investigation. The police, however, have said they are unaware of the existence of any gang called the Coyotes in the area and that their inquiries in the drug world have not produced any leads in his disappearance. 
Jessie's mother has since quit her job to devote herself full-time to the search for her son, but as of November 2023, he's never been found, and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>